We're now recording on the computer and now we're recording. Okay. So hello and welcome. I'm Susan Guthrie and I'm so happy that you are all joining me today because I have a very special guest who's going to help those of you who are dealing with a high conflict divorce or ex um, deal with that person and be able to sort of disengage and move forward and find your power. In fact, Virginia's information is going to be helpful to anyone going through divorce because I don't think it's possible to have a divorce without some level of conflict or at least um, some level of needing to discuss difficult emotions and difficult topics. So I, uh, let me introduce you to my guest. Virginia Gilbert is a licensed marriage and family therapist um, in private practice in Los Angeles, and she specializes in high conflict divorce and sex and love addiction, which can often lead to high conflict divorce. Those may have something to do with each other. Um, she's also a freelance author, and she has several excellent articles that have appeared in HuffPost, Good Men Project, Addiction.com, and other publications. So I highly recommend you Google her or visit her website um, and to read some of that content. But most importantly for our purposes today, She's the author of a book that I found a little while ago called Transcending High Conflict Divorce, How to Disengage from Your Ex and Find Your Power. And for those of you who are watching this on the YouTube channel, I'm holding up the book. Um, I, f I personally have found the book to be really helpful. I use it when I coach clients. And so I'm really thrilled that Virginia's joining us today. I think you're all um, in for a great experience and some great uh, help and advice. So thank you for joining us, Virginia. Thank you so much, Susan. I'm really excited to be here. So I appreciate you inviting me. Well, it's, I, I want to tell the listeners a little bit of the background of the book because it's a little unusual for me when I was doing um, my former podcast, Breaking Free, a modern divorce podcast, people would send us their books all the time, um, hoping to be guests on the show. And that's not how I found your book. In fact, I found your book before I found you. And um, I, I think that's significant because I found the book, I was uh, scrolling through, I think my Instagram free feed and Tara Eisenhard, who is a mm. divorce coach that I follow, mm -hmm. who is also, um, I believe she's given you... Um, one of the um, written, you know, uh, the endorsements, yeah, endorsements on the book. Yeah. Um, I love Tara's feed on Instagram, and she had um, a blurb about the book, and I, I saw that. I reached out. I went right on Amazon.com and ordered it. And I have to tell you, I love the book, and I, that's coming from a 30-year divorce professional who specializes in high-conflict divorce for and coaches people to this day. Your book is really about how to disengage from that high conflict situation, how to move beyond it. And so when I then saw you on my LinkedIn feed, I said, oh my gosh, there she is. I need to reach out to her. And we've connected since then. But this is one of those rare cases where I found the book first. And that's why I'm just so happy that you're here. This book is going to be truly helpful to high conflict divorce individual, uh, you know, people going through that experience, but also really anyone going through divorce or through any, you know, traumatic or difficult transformation or change in life, because a lot of this information is about you, not about your ex. And we were just exactly. talking about that. So one of the things that I've found from doing a podcast is that most people who write books have some experience of whatever it is they're writing about themselves. And that's true for you as well. You called your divorce, this word, apocalyptic. Mm -hmm. And I have to, I, I think that's pretty darn descriptive. Um, but you also said that you know now co-parent successfully with your ex. And so for listeners who are thinking that's a fairy tale, that can't happen, maybe you can give them a little of your backstory and how, how you got here today. Yes. Um, so uh, my ex and I split up 16 years ago. Our children at the time were six and a year and a half. And I thought, because there was so much conflict in the marriage, well, we'll get divorced, we'll have separate households, the conflict will die down, and things will be better for the kids. And that did not happen. That was not the case. It was 
acrimonious for many years. And um, we went to therapy together sometimes. And when we'd go together, usually the therapist would be like deer in the headlights. They just, this level of conflict was overwhelming. And that's a really bad feeling when you're a client, when your therapist is freaked out. I was um, going to say, you don't want your therapist looking at you no. like, oh my God, what do I do with these two? Yeah. Like you guys are bad. So, <laughs> so that didn't help. And, um, and sometimes I'd go alone and the therapist, um, would sort of give me kind of typical co-parenting advice or, you know, use your I statements or, you know, they'll get over it. And I think all of that is great for a garden variety divorce. It was not applicable to the kind of divorce that I had at the time. So I felt a lot of shame. I felt isolation. I felt hopeless. I could not make my bad divorce good. So I just started researching high conflict divorce. And I found our mutual friend, Bill Eddy, um, and his information on the High Conflict Institute. And I read other books about high conflict divorce. And I really began to understand it's just a different species. It just, it's just different from you know, I, what I call a garden variety divorce. So I wrote an article for Huffington Post called What Therapists Don't Tell You About Divorcing a High Conflict Personality. And I was besieged with emails from people all over the country saying, are you in my divorce? Are you in my house? Like you are the only therapist who gets it. And I think that's really because most therapists, now therapists are getting educated about high conflict divorce. 16 years ago, they really didn't know about it. Um, and so I started, you know, that's one of my niches in my private practice is high conflict divorce. So that's how it started. But it was in the course of, researching high conflict divorce and some other tools that I'll get into later that I began to understand how to manage the conflict, but also how to change the way I was behaving because I was reacting to it and I was doing things unwittingly to really fuel the conflict. So once I learned how to change my own behavior, there was a big shift and he changed as well. I mean, I can't comment on that because it's his own story. But now we really are amicable. Like if you had said this to me 10 years ago, I would have said, it's never going to happen. Forget it. We're terminal. But um, like we were at my daughter's parent conference recently. She's a senior in high school. We were cordial. We were laughing together. It was just like, oh, yeah, I had my kids with him. And uh yeah, I mean, it's just been such a game changer for me. And so when I counsel people on transcending high conflict divorce, it's not just professional, it's personal. Like I know it can happen. Well, and I think that's really impactful for our listeners to hear. Cause as I said earlier, you know, I meet people all the time who are so caught up in their high conflict divorce, like you just described thinking there's no end to this and there's no way to fix it. So the fact that you've actually been through it, now written a book about how to do it, um, I think that's, that's what really reached out to me as a professional in reading the book. Because you know I've been doing divorce for 30 years. I did a lot of high conflict divorce in my private practice when I was in Connecticut. But it, it's kind of like what you were just saying, you know, 16 years ago, therapists didn't know a lot about high conflict divorce. If therapists didn't know about it, attorneys definitely didn't know right. about it, right? I mean, right. I, you, you go to law school, you take a bar exam, there's no, uh, there's no input on or education on what a high conflict you know, personality is or dealing with any of that. So I came about my education the same way you did, Bill Eddy, the High Conflict Institute, Megan Hunter. Um, for those who are listening, I do I highly suggest going to Breaking Free, a Modern Divorce podcast and listening. We have episodes both with Bill Eddy and Megan Hunter and several others on high conflict. Because one of the things that I've noticed lately, and maybe you've noticed it as well, that the terms high conflict and particularly narcissist. It seems like everybody thinks their divorce is a high conflict divorce and everyone is divorcing a narcissist, which statistics would say that's not possible that everyone is. But certainly, you know, divorce is a hotbed of negative emotion or difficult emotion. It's certainly going to bring out the bad behaviors on both sides. You know, you mentioned both your own and the other parties. But Although every divorce has some kind of conflict, 
there are psychological reasons that create that conflict. So I think it might help people, you know, with your background, if you could go into those psychological reasons that are creating conflict in divorce. Right. So usually, well, I want to back up for a minute and say there's a, a, a old saying in family court lore, and you might have heard this, that Mother Teresa never marries Hitler, meaning... Yes. That's a chapter to, in your book. Yeah. So <laughs> I love it. People used to think it was two people of equal pathology driving high conflict divorce. So, and sometimes that's the case. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's not. Sometimes you've got sort of somebody who's just more reacting to the other person. Um, and sometimes you've got somebody who's really functions pretty normally and the other person just drives conflict. So it does not take two people to drive conflict. It, it's, it can sometimes only be one. But in any case, with one or both parties, you've got some features of a personality disorder, meaning narcissism, borderline, histrionic, antisocial, and you don't have to have the full-on disorder, but there's like features of it. So that's inflexible thinking, you know, very black and white worldview, emotional reactivity, extreme behaviors. Um, so when people have those characteristics, it's hard to resolve anything. It's hard to communicate. Um, there's also often aspects of attachment disorders, and I could do a whole other podcast on attachment disorders. It's a, it's a really complicated. So basically, an attachment disorder is when somebody in childhood didn't get a appropriate attunement from the parents and so they don't believe relationships are safe places and so um, when the divorce happens it kind of re-triggers their attachment trauma and you often see that driving kind of cases where there's parental alienation where one person is trying to sort of co-opt the child and, and claim that child all for their own. Um, and then I think the third aspect is really unprocessed grief and we'll get into that later, but it's so important to go through the grief process and accept that your your marriage is over and your your ex is the way that they are um, in order to be able to kind of manage the conflict and move on. You know, I think that I what you just said there really strikes me because you said the word accept accept that your ex is who they are. And that, you know, I deal with people. I just was speaking to a woman the other day and she was telling me the story of her divorce in very, you know, descriptive terms of all the trauma and high conflict and all of the things that her ex had done and, you know, how horrible he was and all of these things. And then at the very end of what, I think it was about 10 minutes really of like telling me the story. <laughs> the timeline, yeah. she, she told me it was seven years ago and mm -hmm. she's mm -hmm. still so enmeshed and embedded in it mm -hmm. and wanted to talk to me about how to change him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How to, you know, there was no acceptance this many years down the road of mm -hmm. the fact that that's just how he is and you know, maybe she, you know, there are better ways to approach it than changing him. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, you know, the, the, that is something that I see frequently with high conflict divorces or breakups or whatever you want to call it. It's not over when the divorce is over. Oh no. It goes on <laughs> just like, and you said even about your own, yeah. it goes on and it can go on forever unless you are unless something happens to intervene, unless you get the book, unless you meet a therapist like you who knows what they're dealing with, or unless they listen to a podcast like this and start moving in the right direction. So what is it about high conflict that, that keeps people stuck? Um, well, so, I mean, there's a, there's a few aspects. There's the communication. And I think what I see in, in virtually every case is that one person or both people are trying to give the other person an epiphany. They're trying to change that person's entire personality. And the thinking is, if I can just get them to be reasonable, then we can co-parent and it'll all be great. And, you know, if you couldn't get your ex to be reasonable when you were married, you're definitely not going to be able to do it when you get divorced. But it's this sort of really grasping attachment to this outcome 
of I got to give that person an epiphany. And, you know, it's not received well, on the other hand, when somebody's lectured to or yelled at or told that they're not a good parent. It just, it doesn't go over well. So it really, really drives the conflict. So it's important to learn to kind of bracket whatever your opinions are about your ex. You can still think they're crazy, but learn how to communicate in a skillful way and learn how to manage your own reactions so you're not doing things to kind of fuel the conflict. Yeah, that's um, something, you know, we, we've talked before and shows have been done on Bill Eddy's Biff method or is the keep your correspondence with your ex brief, informative, friendly, but firm. Mm -hmm. And how many times have you seen an email that oh. the one person has sent to the other one that's four pages long oh, that yeah. explains everything the other parent is doing wrong, the research that they've done on why mm -hmm. it should be done mm -hmm. a different way. Yeah. And, you know, all that does is, is actually incite a high conflict personality to continue doing what they're doing. Um, but people do that all the time in this. All hopes, the time. The hope that it's going to, to change the other person. They also will, because so much of the communication you get from your ex is, is an attack. I mean, it, it, you know, high conflict personalities attack through their commu communication. Mm -hmm. People try to defend themselves yeah. and they will, they will give the dissertation of the, mm -hmm. I, I looked at eight of our last emails and this is what <laughs> we actually said. Yeah. And you know how that's not helpful either, is it? Well, it just invites debate because high conflict personalities love to argue. So if you defend yourself or get self-righteous or get you know, upset, and that comes across in an email, it's just, you're like just inviting more. Right, which inviting is exactly the conflict. opposite of what yeah. you want. Yes, so maybe exactly. you could just review, you don't call it Biff, you call it... Um, so, so it's, so I called it B-I-N-F, so I, yeah. uh, so it's brief, B, don't do the 500 word single spaced email, which is either going to make the other person glaze over or get really angry be informative. So I find that a lot of people bring subjectivity into their emails. So, you know, this is my opinion, or when you said this, I felt upset, or, uh, you know, parenting advice. None of that is information. You really want to think like a reporter. You know, information is, Sally has a dentist appointment Thursday at four o'clock. Can you take her? Um, that's it. So leave everything that's subjective out of it. So where I kind of veer off a little bit from Bill Eddy is he says, shoot for a friendly tone. I think sometimes that's a stretch. I think neutral is a good tone. So really take all the personality out of your correspondence, you know, try to be like a robot. And so no, um, you know, you want to keep all the sarcasm out, you no know, emojis, no, you know, don't do anything weird with your fonts, just be very neutral. Um, and then the last part is to be firm, like don't, you know, keep your boundaries, no waffling, don't try to negotiate anything, just, you know, state your point, set a limit, and don't use emails to negotiate. That's a very good point as well. You know, I always tell my clients, do not engage. You know, if you're going to use emails, and first I, I do want to say one thing I do also recommend for clients is using one of the co-parenting apps for communication. Mm -hmm. My mm -hmm. personal favorite is, as my listeners know, is FAIR, um, F-A-Y-R.com. Um, but those are a great way to keep all of your communications all within an app. And to go back and forth in this very, I love your term neutral because friendly might be a stretch. Um, Biff maybe is easier to say than bin. Yeah, but, definitely. Uh, <laughs> but it, but I do I agree with you. Keeping it neutral and keeping it, you know, one of the things that I always know a client has made progress is when they show me an email they got from their ex, which is the you know single space five thousand word essay, and what they sent back was two sentences. Yes. And yes. Incredibly effective though. And I've had clients tell me how freeing it is 
when they finally get that down, that, that BINF response and the way of communicating because they stop getting five page long emails from their ex. So maybe that's a little bit of what you were talking about earlier, that once you learn how to start managing, you, you get some of your freedom. Yeah, you just don't have to take everything personally. Like your ex is entitled to think whatever they think. You don't have to take it on and get defensive. Right. And that's, you know, I found as I work with the clients who are years past the divorce, but still buried in the conflict or buried in the process, that they're almost in a state of um, like Pavlov's dogs. You know, they are just so triggered by anything and everything that their ex does that they just keep on this little hamster wheel of repetitive communication that just perpetuating that. And then I saw that you mentioned something called divorce PTSD. And I was wondering, is that sort of a part of, the, of that totally. PTSD? Totally. Totally. So divorce PTSD is just it's just trauma. So when you have this sustained conflict, uh, your nervous system doesn't really settle down. And so you're either in hyper arousal, which means you're super activated and you're hyper vigilant and you're looking around like what other, what other bomb is going to drop. And you know, there's been a lot of bombs dropping. So, but you're always sort of poised for a fight. And when people are always poised for a fight and irritated, they do things to, inflame conflict and they tend to ruminate and they get very preoccupied about the ex. So when you keep telling yourself this problem story, you, as you said, you stay very entrenched in it. It's really hard to get out of it and be objective. Um, and then the other part of PTSD is being in hypo arousal, which is like very numb and checked out and kind of passive. And people who start drinking a lot during divorce, they, they're trying to numb out. So um, you really need to like learn to kind of stabilize your nervous system. Um, and it's important to do whatever you can to sleep. If you need to go to the doctor and get medication, do it. Um, eat properly, eat, you know, if you're having trouble with your appetite, like small meals during the day, utilize your coping skills, exercise is really important, creative endeavors are really important. Um, so I find that one thing that really keeps people traumatized is they talk to their friends <laughs> incessantly. There's yeah. the saga of like yeah. what's going on. Can and, you believe what she did today? Yeah. yeah. And then let's say, and then your friend or your family members bring their own stuff into it. Like maybe they had a horrible ex or they're afraid for you. And so there's just compounded by other people's emotional stuff. Plus you're kind of like burning out other people, but it's the retelling of the story, the victim story um, that where you're just, you're reliving it. You know, you're reliving what happened in the past and you're worried about the future. And so you never learn to kind of put boundaries on the divorce and so that you can go on with your life. So a lot of what I do is helping people manage that trauma so that they can function better. Yeah. And, well, and move forward. Because, move on. Yeah. Get past that. Let yeah. it go. Move on. You know, it almost becomes an obsession that it becomes totally. something that they are constantly thinking about, constantly trying to stay one step ahead of the other person. Um, but, you know, and you and I talked about this briefly before we got on the, the call. And I think that what happens also is everyone, and even when you're talking about it with friends and family who, by the way, love you, care about you, affirm anything that you say because they want to support you. So yes, he is a jerk. Yes, she is horrible. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's, I don't know how helpful that is, but they're there to support you. But yeah. it's also almost an entire focus on the behavior of the other person. And one thing that I think is really the, the core message of your book and what is so helpful and why I recommend it to my clients is because you talk about them taking a look at their own behavior and yes. their own ownership of at least some part of this, even if it's just the perpetuation 
of the yes. conflict through these repetitive behaviors. So maybe you can explain a little bit about that and how they can move beyond that. Yes. Um, you know what? I'm going to interrupt you, Susan, because I can't remember if there's a specific question. Is now the time I talk about the developmental task of divorce? Do you know what question that is? Um, you can, or you can just talk about, yes, I, am, I, was, I didn't ask it specifically that way, but I can ask if you prefer that. that I that's okay. I can just sort of, I can go into it now. Um, so the question is, how do people move on? Is that, was that? Yeah. How do, okay. how do, how do, why do they focus so much on the other person without ever looking at their own behavior? And yeah, what is that developmental task of divorce? How do they move forward and complete that? Right. So I think with high conflict divorce, it almost becomes an addiction where you, you're, the people get very preoccupied with their ex and they sort of organize their life around, um, you know, trying to anticipate what the ex does or it's just kind of that um, psychological enmeshment that makes it almost impossible to move on. So it really is like an addiction. People get sort of addicted to the anger. And I think in part because sometimes anger is easier to deal with than sadness and grief and, oh, what, you know, what did, what did I do? You know, what am I doing to, to contribute to this? So, um, there's, there's kind of like a developmental task of divorce. And I talk to people about, it's very similar to what children, adolescents, and young adults go through, like sort of completing that gestalt of maturing. So when a child is little, you know, they want to marry their parents. Like they feel so connected to their parents. And then uh, when a child goes through adolescence, suddenly they look at their parents and it's kind of like, oh, like, you're weird, you know, you're embarrassing. <laughs> I don't want to have anything to do yeah, with you. Go away. Um, <laughs> give me some money, but go away. Yeah, yeah. Drive me over to my friend's <laughs> right. house or the mall, give right. me money, and then please right. yeah, go away. I don't want anything to do with you. Um, <laughs> but then, so, and then the young adults who kind of develop their own self-concept and independent living skills are able to have a different relationship with their parents at some point. They look at them and they go, oh, you know, you're not so bad. And uh, you've taught me some things. And they just have a more mature relationship with their parents because they've developed an identity of their own and a self-concept and agency. It's really similar to divorce. So, you know, when you're married, you have all these dreams about your future and, you know, your, your spouse is fabulous. And then when you're going through the divorce, it's like, oh my God, you know, you're the antichrist and you're horrible and I want nothing to do with you. Um, and the people who, who stay stuck in that space have not completed the developmental task because the developmental task is to move from blame to accountability. What was my part in this? Like, who am I now that I'm not married? Do I want to stay an angry ex? Is that my identity now? Or is it something else? So the people who move through that blame place and take accountability and empower themselves, then they can look at their ex and go, oh yeah, you know, we had these kids together. Or, you know, you were sort of, you were my teacher. Like I learned what I needed to learn about myself through the conflict. Um, so those people are able to, to move on. You know, we talk about moving on, but it's kind of like this amorphous, ambiguous thing. Like, what is it? It's what, really yeah. like a developmental task. It's, it's, it's growing up through a bad divorce. So it's really a change in you. Yes. Not a change in the other person, as we were yes. talking about before. There's and they focus. don't have to change for you to change. And that's really, think about the power in that. Yeah. For people who are listening to this, I hope you are all hearing that, that the real secret here is that it's an internal change and really personal growth that sets you free and gives you your freedom from this perpetual you know, hamster wheel of high conflict. You are not going to change your high conflict personality person, but you can change how you respond to that person. And that changes your life. Um, I love you call divorce. And this is one of my basic 
premises is that divorce is an opportunity for personal growth, any divorce, but certainly a high conflict divorce. So, so what additional suggestions do you have for someone who wants to view their divorce as an opportunity for personal growth? So there's a couple different tools that I use. I think sometimes when people are really entrenched in blame and feeling very persecuted, it's helpful to kind of inventory your divorce. So, and it's a little bit like the fourth step in a 12 step program. If anybody's been in a 12 step program where you write down all the ways, the reasons why you resent your ex and maybe your former in-laws, or maybe you don't like your attorney or anybody that you feel has hurt you, you write down um, who the person is that's hurt you, what they did specifically, the effect that it's had on you. But, but this is really the important part, what you could have done differently. Because when you do that, like I said, it's very empowering. It really shifts you from, you know, sort of victim and feeling very persecuted to, oh, um, this was my part in it. I could have done things differently. I can't change the past, but I can, I can do things differently going forward. So that's like a very helpful kind of almost cognitive behavioral tool because it changes the way that you think about your ex and the problem. Um, another tool, and I'm going to mention this at the, at the end of our podcast, is um, I actually work with people on doing a personal growth journey. So it's really important for people to identify their values. And I work with people on this. And oftentimes I ask them, well, what are your values? And they look at me like, what do you mean? Um, <laughs> I want to be a good person and do good in the world. Yeah. yeah. Um, what does that so, mean? <laughs> exactly. So I help people get very clear on what their values are. Um, and then like write a mission statement for the rest of their life. So um, you can't figure out your purpose in life or what you want to do without knowing your values. And I find that when people are feeling uncomfortable about things or unsure of a direction, it's because they're acting in ways that don't line up with their values. Um, so writing a mission statement, which is kind of like what companies do for their businesses, you know, an right. example of a mission statement would be, um, like TED Talks, I think, has the most brilliant mission statement, which is just spread ideas. Um, so that's the example of something that a business would do, but a person can do it as well. So that's really a great thing for someone to do post-divorce because it, it takes you from your identity of, I was this married person and my life looked like this, to now you know, I'm, I'm post-divorce, I'm post-married, and this is what I'm going to do going forward. So it's just another way of shifting your focus from your ex to you and what you can do. And your future, like moving yeah. forward, right? Instead of yeah. all these things that have happened in the past, um, it, it puts you in that forward frame of mind. I mean, like the podcast, right? Divorce and beyond. Beyond, so totally. So that's, yeah, that's the most important part. And I always tell, I've told clients for ever, if you've been my client, you've heard me say this, divorce is just a finite period of time. And then you have the rest of your life. And that's what's important. It's not the year that you're going through the divorce, the month, the year, whatever that might be. Focus on that future. So you do have a special gift for listeners that will help them with that personal growth journey. Do you want to tell them about that now? Yeah. So I actually have a template for people where it explains in more detail the developmental tasks that they're in. Um, and then it helps, there's prompts to define your values, like what are values? How do you figure out what's important to you? And then there's a prompt to actually write a mission statement so people understand how to do it. So it's just, it's not like it has to be perfect. It's a working document, but I think it's really helpful in just setting your intentions um, about how you want to be going forward, like getting clarity. So if people are interested in that, they can email me. Um, my email address is vgilbertmft at gmail.com and put um, in the subject box, Divorce and Beyond podcast. And then I'll know to send you, uh, to send you the personal growth journey template. 
Well, that, that's wonderful. Thank you. Because I think that, you know, I, I hope that listeners will reach out because don't underestimate the power of putting things down on paper, putting pen, you know, ink to paper or, you know, doing it online or whatever, you know, format you're doing it in. There's something exceedingly powerful about setting intentions, about making that look forward. So I, I highly recommend people reach out for that. I also want to make sure they know where to get the book. Um, it's called Transcending High Conflict Divorce, How to Disengage from Your Ex and Find Your Power. So why don't you tell people how they can both get find the book and get in touch with you? Right. So the book, you can just go on Amazon and um, you can either put in the title or you can put in my name, Virginia Gilbert, and it'll bring up the book. It's available in Kindle and paperback. Um, my website is www.virginiagilbertmft.com. Um, I've got blogs on the website. You can get my contact information. Um, I do offer people a free 15 minute phone consultation and if they want to find out about working with me. Um, so those are the ways to get in touch. Well, that's, thank you. And I'll put all of that information, a link to the book, a link to the website um, and um, Virginia's email address again in the show notes. So please visit that. You can um, also find information on divorceandbeyondpod.com. So Virginia, thank you so much for joining me today. I know that you know, this is a very hopeless area for people uh, when they get caught in this cycle of continual conflict with their ex for years and years. So I, I know there's hope in what you're saying to people. I know there's hope and a path forward in your book. Um, and so I very much appreciate you sharing all of this with my listeners. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. It was really a pleasure uh, speaking with you.